Hello everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's Shaw here, your host, and I just wanted to give a special thank you to all the guests, the wonderful, fabulous, fantastic guests that I've had on the show this season. It is a joy and a pleasure to have met you all. Some of you I'm still in touch with, so thank you so much. And we are, it's hard to believe that this podcast was started during the pandemic. Like many of you, I found myself with a bit more time working from home. I always did, but working from home more. And also um, not necessarily uh, feeling fulfilled creatively. I mean, I do have some creative endeavors, But my friend Ruthie Phillips, who was on season one, she started a podcast many, many years ago. This was in 2007, I think. It was a long, long time ago. It was before podcasts were popular and I was one of her first guests. And I just remembered that during the pandemic. I reached out to her as well and she was on the show. But I thought, why not? Because I was reconnecting with so many people whom I hadn't seen for a while or you know we get very we all get very busy with our careers with our families with children with people it just gets to be busy so we all reconnected in many ways with several different people and um, I thought well you, do you know what your life is interesting not mine necessarily theirs their life is interesting let's put it on the show and so many of them to my surprise said yes now season three i want to say a special thanks to kitty andrews she kicked off season three talking about decluttering she was fantastic she has a thriving business you know many people do struggle with getting rid of things I I don't know if I struggle with it. I believe now and again I will throw something out or you know, obviously I give things to charity. And then months later I'll think, oh, where is that thing? I could use that. <laughs> and so I just have to laugh at myself because everybody else is laughing at me. So I might as well laugh at myself. But <laughs> I just think, oh gosh, what, you know, this happened with a little, I was given... <laughs> It's so funny. I was given this little um, straw. It it looked like a pole almost. It was a handbag, very unusual, but it was just sat in a box for years and years and years. And I was throwing things out. I said, right, this has to go. And then something came up whereby I thought, oh, where's that? Where is that? I could really use that. And of course, I, well, I wasn't sure if I had given it away, so of course I looked through everything, but it was gone. I thought, yes, I've given that away. Let it go, Shah. Let it go. And it's gone to somebody, I'm sure. It could be a dog is chewing it up. Who knows? But Kitty helped us all to think a bit more about how we get rid of things, why we get rid of things, and why we can't get rid of some things, why we put up a struggle with getting rid of things. She also helped us all to learn how much better your space is when it's clear. I've always known that spiritually for me, a cluttered place is very, um, I would say, disturbing. I find it uncomfortable. Cleanliness and clearing. Now, there is a difference because, you know, uh, it just depends on how many things you have, how many plants you have, how many people you have in your home, all of those things. But I do like my little bits and pieces and I like them to be in a particular place. And then on the second episode, we had Emily McGuire. Emily, I wanted on the show because she's very successful in how she recruits people for acting for the creative arts. And she has a roster of movies and television shows that she's worked on. You know, she's had clients working on them. She gets people work, basically. And when she was on the show, she had just been working on Mission Impossible. One of them, two, three, four, five. I don't know which one. I can't keep up. 
but she was on one of those shows and many different UK TV shows are very popular so and other movies as well so I really was intrigued by how she helps people not just get the roles but she also helps them to uh, improve their self-esteem their mindset and how to improve their work as an actor as a writer or whatever they're doing so Emily was great to have on the show and then I had Gayla Gorman she talked about alternative therapies and a lot of her work alternative medicines which is always very interesting uh, everybody trains in a different field you're drawn to where you want to be some people love acupuncture uh, some people go into hypnotherapy or the talking therapies and it's all very interesting and then I decided to do a, an episode on are you born with gifts you know creative gifts or is it nurture is it nature or nurture and I put together a collage as such of some of the guests and snippets of when I've asked the questions it's a question I usually ask my guests and then we had Kristen Donnelly on the show and she talked about empathy then we had Bola oh now Bola oh Bola Abimbola she is incredible what a beautiful spiritually uplifted human being Bola is she sits in her truth you see her you you watch her you you look at her and you can see that she's been through things but she sits in a space of calm and healing and she gives she emanates for me a very positive soul who is on a mission during this lifetime to spread a good word to people however she does that she's spiritually evolving and you just know there are people you just know who are spiritually evolving and Bola is one of them who is going to lots of heights she's got a very popular podcast so go and check her out all the links are in the show notes there go and watch the full episode as well just listening to her voice will heal something within you she's absolutely fantastic spectacular and then we had Alicia Patterson on the show and that was a very interesting conversation about pelvic health an area that I think goes amiss so Alicia and I talk a lot about her journey into that area into exploring that area and why she wanted to uh, look into the area of pelvic health and then I did a solo episode. Now, I haven't done a lot of solo episodes this season because I had a lot of guests and many people did approach us and we do have uh, some episodes already in the works. So I wanted to get the guests on the show and I did less solo episodes, but I, I wanted to do, I was inspired to do an episode on a spiritual a spiritual law the law of relativity and that well you can go and listen to it but I talk a lot about um, how everything is as you perceive it to be and in relation to everything else and then I welcomed Betty Kovacs now Betty talked a lot about loss and bereavement is one of those areas that people are often afraid to touch and then when you get into the area of spirituality and bereavement and lost souls or uh, you know sudden death or you look at things like past lives or even what Betty and I talked about which was near-death experiences and I have a few of those episodes this season there's more in the works Betty told us all about unfortunately some loss that she had in her life how she dealt with it but also how that loss opened up many doors to her perception her spirituality and her spiritual gifts and being able to see and feel things so go and have a listen to that one as well season three we're recapping here we're on uh, the 10th episode which was Tanya Ho who's a wonderful she she uh, has this beautiful retreat muse therapy retreats 
it's in Thailand and I have to say she is wonderful I subscribe to her newsletter and she's always giving workshops unfortunately a lot of them because I'm in the UK Thailand we're talking nine ten hours ahead I think and um, you know a lot of those you can attend online which is great the next one is like two in the morning UK time I really would like to attend but it's a tough one so um, Tanya though she is so connected to her inner soul she knows what she's meant to be doing this retreat this muse flower I said muse therapy muse flower retreat uh, if you can get there go because you only need to look at some of the classes some of the sessions she holds online to feel that energy so thank you Tanya that was a great interview then we met with Corey Roy my New Orleans a native Corey is a wonderful medium psychic she is based in New Orleans born and raised well I don't think she was born there actually or well, I think her whole family was there I, anyway listen to the episode because she tells us and because this was this was all the way back in March when when we interviewed and Corey is an interesting person because of her history and New Orleans if you've never been there you're missing out it is a special place indeed then Bernadette Thompson was on the show now Bernadette the ancestry talk is fascinating we talked all about her work with helping families connect in that way looking at ancestral ties and how or why we've come to maybe carry things around our whole lives ancestrally you know way back and it's fascinating stuff so it was great to meet Bernadette and then we had the wonderful Pam Barosh on the show and Pam again we talked a lot about past lives and you know near-death experiences and these are fascinating people do remember things they can't move they can't speak they know but they know there is a part of them that has some consciousness then we had Sophia Demos on the show where we talked about coincidence, the divine language of coincidence. And we talked about her book, all about miracles as well. And it really is a mindset and how, you know, with Sophia, she was an architect and then she went into a fashion design business and then she became a mental health therapist. So there was a lot of ins and outs and, you know, a counselor with the Salvation Army and things like that. But she through her journey through her life's journey she learned about the divine language of coincidence and how miracles come about in our lives and if we blink we might miss them because i believe miracles come into all of our lives it's just a matter of identifying them and accepting them and then we had the wonderful Ashley Abramson on the show and she talked a lot about self-love. A very hot topic at the moment. How do we self-love? Why do some people find it very difficult to have love for themselves? And the link between the two. And sometimes if you cannot find love for yourself, it's very difficult to love other people. So Ashley joined me for a very in-depth conversation about self-love. Then we had the wonderful Stephanie Frizel on the show, the artist, the singer. She goes by the name Dylan for her singing. Uh, Stephanie talked, she holds that creative writing or, or self care again for the creatives. And she holds these workshops where, you know, musicians, artists can join and join together and get inspired, be inspired by each other. Then we had Sharon Farber on the show, another medium, and Sharon and I talked a lot about mediumship and some of the differences, some things we, you know, we believe differently. I believe in ghosts. I've seen them myself and she doesn't. So we have different, different views on things. And that's the beauty of the podcast to have people on the show who have different experiences and different views. And then we had the wonderful Sankarshan Das on the show, a Hare Krishna whose spirituality just touches my soul. He has chosen a life of simplicity, 
He's chosen a life of service to others. Just being in a room with him, sharing a space with him was powerful, enlightening, calming, and healing. As a musician as well, you know, he can tell us all about, and he told us all about his experiences working with Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, a lot of those people in the 60s, he was around and he experienced the summer of love living in San Francisco. It must have been an amazing time. We can all read about it now in awe and Sankarshan Das was there. So it was wonderful to meet him and have him on the show and I hope to have him back again soon. His meditative states are mind-blowing and if you can attend any meditation with him, I think you'll find a new way in which to meditate. And then Kathy McDaniel joined me to talk a lot about her near-death experiences. Kathy is a special, special lady. Uh, she is just amazing. She's been through so much and some of it I chose not to air for various reasons. I think we need to protect people as well. And so sometimes we will talk about certain things and, you know, they'll get cut out in the editing because I am, I would like to protect people's privacy in different ways. But Kathy has been through a lot in life and she is a special woman. She has had so much loss in her life. And having those, because there were several near-death experiences, having those near-death experiences has almost catapulted her into a different sphere in learning and understanding about our purpose on this earth plane right now. So please go and listen to that. And then for season three, episode 20, we had the wonderful Leif Gregerson on the show. Now Leif, is fascinating because he has really taken on board this journey of mental health and mental health awareness. He has personal experience, he's an expert by experience, he knows all about it. If there are any queries about how people can become ill, why they're ill, what happens when they're on the psychiatric ward, how they might feel, how they may perceive things. What's it like to be in psychosis? Leaf gives us a bird's eye view of exactly that. I felt so honored to have him on the show. So grateful to him for sharing his experiences. So many people watched the episode. Thank you so much. Many people, it's one of our highest rated shows not just on YouTube, but on Spotify and Apple. And people identified. He allowed us in. Also, he's a writer and he's written several books, several e-books about his experiences. Some of his books are on Amazon as well. I am so, so grateful for his contribution to The Inquisitive Wren Season 3. And again, uh, I can't thank him enough. Then we had Lori Singer on the show, a psychotherapist. You know, I love to have psychotherapists on the show, therapist counselors, so that we can all talk about what it's like and how they help people. And everyone's had their own journey. Lori was so generous in the information she gave about her personal life and how it affected her decisions in life and again about her personal loss, her bereavement with her son, and a lot of it is just heart-wrenching. But she has found solace in physical activity. She climbs mountains, she runs. She's amazing, just an amazing lady. And again, very, very grateful to have her on the show. Thank you so much, Lori, for sharing all of that. And then the artist, Sally Brown, was on the show. And again, Sally, oh, just a beautiful soul. And these are the people I look for. And it's so funny, Sally and I did the interview months and months ago, uh, but we had problem when it came to editing the sound. She knows her art. She's very, very talented. She's very aware. 
and again, her journey was an interesting one into art. And she shares with us, what do you do when you know you have a gift? And how do you share it with the world whilst making a living as well? As we know, that's the plight of most artists. And then, of course, for our finale season three, episodes 23 and 24, was a fabulous and amazing Claire Hunt, who joined me to talk about workplace bullying, specifically narcissistic abuse, which is a whole different animal, really. And if you've ever been bullied, you've got to watch this episode. You must listen to this. The information that Claire gives from personal experience, it's something she studied. She spent years collecting evidence about facts about. She's researched psychology. She could be a psychologist. I mean, she knows so much about the topic itself. There were some areas that differed, like for instance, in the UK, we have a lot of legislation that helps us and backs us up. And also, I've seen people do really well combating it when they have documented things. And Claire is saying in the United States, it's very different documenting things is not helpful it doesn't prove anything whereas in the UK it does it holds weight so but overall you know it doesn't change the fact that when you're being bullied you feel as if you're on an island because most people will be either afraid to approach the bully or go against the bully unless you're of a strong consistency and it is fascinating to know that charities, uh, the healthcare, prof- healthcare profession and education are the top industries for bullying. It's fascinating. Nonprofit. You just, how do you make sense of it? And healthcare, you would think that people go into healthcare to help others, not to hurt them. But so they may treat, what I have learned through my experience is that they may treat their patients well, but they don't treat each other well. And who knows what happens when they go home and close the doors. So Claire is fascinating. Follow her on her very popular, very well followed YouTube channel. She also writes, she has a blog. So Claire Hunt joined me for the season finale. And I just wanted to say a huge, huge thanks to all the guests on the show and also the ones who, whereby we've already recorded an episode and you'll appear in season four. This season, we published 24 episodes and of course this one. And the previous seasons, we only did 22. And we did a couple more. Well, this one, the last one was a two-parter because it was very, very long and very and needed, very much needed. But also I'm trying to do a bit more, the best I can. I can only do two a, two a week, uh, two a week, two a month <laughs> because of my schedule. But it's something I enjoy. It's good for my own mental health to speak to other people. It's something, if you've known me since I was a child, and yes, I do have, still have friends from childhood still friends from childhood amazing and we're still in touch and they can tell you that i was always asking the questions i was always starting a group i started a bike group then we had a dance club oh dance clubs amazing we used to charge our relatives to come and sit and watch us uh we had then we had a group and i was always getting people to talk about something or do something and you know, not a whole lot has changed, really. <laughs> well, I think, kind of, I'm older. But this is something that I love doing. And I will continue to do it as long as I'm enjoying it. That's that's all I can say. The numbers will follow. I'm a firm believer in that. Who who needs to see it, who needs to hear it, will. I, we are taking next month off. We will return in October. Uh, with season four. Stay tuned. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe to the channel and turn on your post notifications so that you don't miss an upload. Also follow us on Spotify or Apple 
and I also publish polls. So on the community tab for YouTube, you'll see polls. If you can participate in those, that's fantastic. It just gives me a sense of who you are and what you want to hear. So there's a new poll that's going to go up with this episode asking you what topics you want to, me to approach in the future for season four. As we prepare, as we start to film soon, uh, we have a few episodes already done, but as we get filming again in October, we want to know what you want to see. If you've got a suggestion of someone you think I would be interested in interviewing, please let me know. And don't forget to leave us a comment. It's helpful, even if you put a smiley face or, or, or crying laughing face, whatever, or thumbs up or prayer hands, whatever you put in, a little heart, something, just to let us know you've heard it, you've listened to it. Still, there's a huge percentage of people who are watching but not subscribed. I have to say, I'm guilty of doing that as well on YouTube. Some, you know what YouTube is like. You watch what you need to watch and you move on. But I am being, I'm making an effort to be more conscious of that now. And I'm subscribing to more people on YouTube because being on the other side of it, I can see how important that is for channels. Thank you once again. I hope you've all uh, enjoyed the season. Stay tuned for season four. We will return Make sure you, you know, the, the, on YouTube, there's the podcast link as well. We will still be posting bits and pieces like shorts during our time off just to keep you engaged. And again, follow on Instagram uh, because there will be posts, you know, while we're off now and then. And I may even put a holiday post up there. You just never know. You just have to subscribe and see. Uh, but subscribe to the channel because many people aren't subscribed. It's just less effort if you do. And then the new video will pop up on your feed. And with that, I'll say a special sending love, sending blessings, sending over abundance to you all. And we'll see you soon. But what's happening at 5.30 in the morning when you're brushing your teeth and getting ready for your day? Your brain starts to say, at least mine did, uh, did I email that person? Did I write down to phone that person? Did I, did I, should I, would I, blah, 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 all of these things start to crumble, jumble up in your brain. And you're tired by the time, I found that I was tired by the time I got to my desk, simply as a result of the, you know, the little battery icon at the top of your phone going, meow, okay, there's got to be a better way. So I accepted that, okay, I'm going to have these thoughts in the morning. Oh, yes, and then the panic. By the time you get to your desk, because number one, you're tired. Number two, you just don't know where to turn. You're overwhelmed. And it's in your head. It's not something that you can see. It's in, it's in your head. All right. What do I do now? I don't know where to start. Now, there are two options. You can either say, I don't know where to start. So I'll do, I'll do some scrolling on Facebook. At least I'll be doing something. Or... And how many times do we spend all day doing busy work because we don't know what to do? Or you can say, all right, what is the one most important thing that needs to, to get done? Or what is the one and or what is the one category? Now, I, I picked on uh, people. Which people, everybody's going to be different, but mine was which people need me first. Say, for, for example, my assistant, what does she need from me so that she can do her job? None of us like to be challenged. None of us like to be challenged in our thought processes about things which we think are a certain way. And then when you're challenging, you've got to rethink it over it. It's, it's not just challenging the actual thoughts, it's challenging yourself. So it's a complete introspection and looking at yourself from top to bottom. It's it's not just a, a normal challenge, so it can be difficult for people to take. But I think in some ways, when you kind of think about rejection again, just using that as an example, to challenge a person's thought process in terms of seeing it as a negative to see it as a positive. If you kind of think about if there's something coming up in life and you don't pursue it because you're going to fail, 
and you've got this fear of failure. So you just walk away from it. And you just don't bother because if you're going to fail, what's the point? If you kind of flip that around and you think, okay, yeah, perhaps I'm going to fail, but how can I look, look at that as a period of growth? What can I actually do about that? What can I learn? So for me, for instance, coming on this podcast, you know, I could be like, in my mind, I could be thinking, oh my God, I'm going to fail. It's, you know, it's going to be the worst thing. But within that, you've got to think, well, what can I learn from this? You know, what can I grow and what can I take away from this moment in life? Because all of life is a big learning curve and we're constantly learning and growing. And for me, if I do this podcast, I could say to myself, okay, maybe it won't go 100% that I want it to go, but I'm going to learn something from it. And the next podcast that I get do, I'm going to readjust, I'm going to reframe, and I'll do it better on the next one. And I think that's the way to look at life, really. It's when you, you challenge that negative, you know, it's just reframing, it's reframing the thought processes. When I started studying alternative medicine in earnest and really getting, becoming interested in more of an Eastern philosophy, Eastern philosophy is really ancient wisdom applied to health, oriental medicine in particular. And everything I studied, all these kind of alternative um, approaches, state-of-the-art technology applied to health and wellness, they were all tapping into energy system that the oriental medicine practitioners call the acupuncture meridians. That was kind of a repeated theme over quite a few years. And honestly, when I first started encountering it, I didn't realize that somebody like me could become an acupuncturist. Like it never, it was so far outside my paradigm <laughs> that I didn't even poke or poke at it to say, well, how do I become one of those? Right. And so it took me quite a few years before I finally um, ran into a group that was providing acupuncture treatment at a place that my husband was working at. And at that point, I was like, oh, I get it. I get how it all fits together. And then I, you know, started following down that path and became an acupuncturist because I wanted one, the formal education, but two, the ability to become a licensed practitioner. So do you think creativity, you think we're born with it or is it something that we learn? Um, no, I think it's something in, in us. Um, I think there's things in our DNA that we don't even know why certain people do certain things. I think there's a thing about certain people with rhythm or there's a certain thing people about math or whatever it is, but I think creativity is innate. I think we are more creative at things than other people. And that speaks to everybody. Some people are great at crafting something and don't even know why they're great at crafting things or whatever. But I would imagine you probably go back a couple of generations and you're sure your family came from that. They were doing that or you heard that all the time and you reacted a certain way to this this rhythm or the, the the sound i think you know the sound of like a preacher's voice uh, that's creative to me because i think a lot of people can have that but don't know it or just don't they're not in tune with their own creativity that they can do naturally uh, and what that means to people you could speak to somebody in a certain way and know that you know how your tone is going to affect that person when you speak to like a father knows I could use a certain tone to kids and they're going to want to fall in line with me. And just instinctively, they're going to know. And I think artists do that. Some of them don't even know they're doing it, but some of them have. I think Prince locked into, he understood. I can sing this song a certain way and women are going to feel something with this. And I think once he's, once he locked into that, which I think would be like in the 1999 time when he understood sonically how I sound, and I'm going to mix that with visually how I look, I will be irresistible to certain people. <laughs> like, and he plays on it his whole career. Like, 
I want to make the voice and the presentation irresistible. Like he tapped into, he's not looking into, he just happens to look a certain way or he's moving a certain way. No, he realized, I see the reaction this is getting. I'm about to fine tune this. And I think each album, he just fine tuned it more every time and switch it up just a little bit, but he knew what you were looking for. And he knew it. He gave off almost the energy like, and I know this is getting you. And you know, I know you, I'm getting you right now. Like, and you know, it sort of throws that playfulness in it. But I think he's just a master of understanding his innate talent, which is why I say music is superpower, because I think people like Prince, Michael, James, uh, Jagger, they they are like they i wouldn't be surprised if they are like uh coming from something that they don't even understand like there was maybe somebody in their family generations ago that was doing the same type of thing it may have been music but it was in something where they just have a, a something that comes out of them that people respond to i think michael jackson is a perfect example of, of the highest level of that because even my daughter who was never around when michael jackson was famous or he's dead when she was born she's a michael jackson fan like she just hears the voice and then it got her and i noticed when she would see the videos she walk in the room and she was just enamored and it took her a second to know that that's the same person because your know, skin got a little lighter but when she realized it was the same dude and he was also that little kid that she sees in some videos jesus it's just something, I think there's something in his voice that attracts children to just identify. Like, they don't even, they don't know nothing about it, but they can hear one of them songs and they're into it. Like, oh, oh, this is great. And now she's doing the dancing. And, you know, her favorite song is Bad. Like, wow. She just loves, she likes looking at it. She thinks it's funny in a sense because it's so, yeah. <laughs> it's so incredible. And she's like, you never see stuff like that. And she's just into the song, like there's something about it. Empathy is entirely about understanding. And because it's about understanding and not adopting, condoning, agreeing, any of those things, it's just about understanding. It actually can't be negative. Mm -hmm. um, because all you're doing is seeking to understand the other person to the best of your ability, which does a lot of things. First of all, it helps you understand what you can and cannot control both about your own life, the world around you, and about the other person. We've also found the longer we've been teaching this and practicing it ourselves, um, our level of, I mean, it makes us get along with other people easier because you like someone's really frustrating. <laughs> you can just kind of say, I don't know what they're going through, or maybe this is happening. It really, what it does is increases curiosity. Um, awakening for, for me is, um really coming to realize the about the infinite intelligence coming to um to know you, we may read about it but coming to really experience that higher self that infinite intelligence and knowing that it is different from the physical ego self that we have been conditioned to believe is who we are there's a moment that that happens for everyone. Not everybody becomes spiritually awakened in this in their lifetime, in, in, in a lifetime. It may take several lifetimes to be spiritually awakened. But that point, when you realize that, when you sense, when you experience that self, that true self, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. You cannot deny its presence anymore. That is spiritual awakening. That is an awakening moment. But there is still a lot of work, I would call it, a lot of experience, a lot of practice that one needs to do after that moment. Because you can be aware of that higher self, but still be stuck in your head or your heart or your gut in that physical duality in in that physical experience of the of the matrix which is which is that ego self not knowing that you can be in this world but not part of it you know you can actually be in your body as an avatar 
but you are able to step and align with that infinite intelligence and draw attract, and attract your experiences, your preferred experiences to you. But we are always in non-duality. It, it is, it doesn't, as long as we're alive, <laughs> we are living in non-duality, but we can operate in non, in, in this. We are living in duality, I meant to say, as long as we're alive. But we can be aware of the different parts of us, that higher self and the physical self. And we can operate more as the higher self. You know, the, the word trauma has become a very uh, popular and really big thing. And I think the last decade, especially, it's just become, uh, you know, one of those buzzwords. So trauma can mean a lot of different things. And for me, uh, pelvic trauma and trauma-informed care and pelvic health care is awareness that so many people you know across all identities and genders have had um, disruptive experiences around this part of their body and we have a pelvic nervous system our nervous system is so sensitive and so tender and really responsive to our experiences and the you know the the pelvic health care and trauma field is just a laundry list of many, many different challenges that show up in this area of people's bodies. And, uh, you know, I'm a counselor and I also um, have a specialty and I really want to focus in and work around specifically with female anatomy and trauma-informed pelvic care. And it's astonishing to me how many people report these very painful experiences with this part of their body and that um, it just continues to happen in their healthcare environment and sometimes at home with their partner. So I just, I feel like it's like a, a huge rabbit hole that we can go down. And um, for me, the most helpful thing was learning about the anatomy of this part of our body and why we might be having these types of responses and starting to understand the muscles and the organs and the nerve system and how all of these parts of us are, you know, talking to our brain. And um, it's been a, a really wild thing for me to start to understand all of this for myself and to work with my clients around this. And it just blows people's minds, which is um, really beautiful. And like, I feel a lot of gratitude to have access to this in my life. So many people on this planet never have access to this type of information or knowing themselves or care. And I also feel really disappointed. I feel like it's kind of like basic human um, knowing of ourselves and how to be with other people. And so many people don't have awareness. And it just feels to me like one of the biggest misses, you know, that we could have. This is our intimate place in our body. This is where we birth children from, you know, it's one of the most primal, primitive kind of biological things. So pelvic trauma is, um, it could be assault, it could be birth trauma, it could be um, a painful medical procedure, it could be horrible symptoms, and people have really chronic pain that they just can't get answers to. So, you know, trauma-informed care means a very wide range of things in um, the healthcare and therapeutic environment. But I do feel like modern medicine really misses this part of healthcare in a lot of uh, very sad ways. So I started turning toward, um, you know, all the expensive, holistic, kind of mysterious ways of caring for this part of our body. And I had incredible results for myself. So I pivoted into doing some training and making sure that I could pass um, these and for this information and modalities onto other people. And, and the internet has just really exploded this. And again, in the last decade, there's so much more information out there. And it can be very confusing. You know, there's a lot of people, um, I just want people to have access to care and therapeutic space that is really safe for them to explore these questions. 
Um, so my, my own experience of my body, I've been doing this kind of exploratory work for myself with all of this content for 15 years and has really shaped my adult life. And I'm so grateful that I got into it when I was young, because it's really turned my health around from our lifestyle, you know, sitting and high levels of stress and, you know, there's fertility challenges and a lot of birthing issues and um, people are in such need around this topic, which is why I'm so grateful for you to ask me on your show and talk about it. How do we relate to something differently if we already have a memory bank of how to relate? How do we change that way in which we relate if the memory bank is there? But the law of relativity suggests that all of these components depend on how we see things. Unconscious uh, nonverbal cues will be informing how you see things, and that will be in relation to something else. That something else will be your beliefs, how you view things. How if you if you believe that when somebody tilts their head to the side, they're querying you, they they or they're questioning or really considering what's being said, um, or if somebody purses their lip as you say a word or something you you may have a belief system about that that you're fully unaware of and so the law of relativity is all about how you see things and how you relate to everything people and things concepts in life all of it it's what you think about it and this is a spiritual law and so this is why whatever you think Whatever you're thinking, whatever you believe, which is why I talked about belief systems. So whatever you believe, whatever you think and think about, it will be in relation to something else. And so the way in which we can become more aware of the law of the spiritual law of relativity and how it works, how whatever we think about things may appear or will inform what happens next because it's the concept of our thinking makes it so, then we can learn to change the outcome of that relation, the outcome of how it affects our lives and the outcome of how we affect the universe. After I had gone through, after my husband and I had gone through the death of our son at 20 years old, um, we had so many experiences with his consciousness after his death. And I felt, and then my husband also was killed in a car accident two years later. I felt that if my experiences, which really helped to heal me and my husband, Ishtvan, if I wrote a book, that if I, I would say to myself at the time, if I could help one person, you know, get through the kind of grief that we have, when someone we love passes, then it will be worth it. And so, and I also felt that these experiences were, were so profound that came to us that they really needed to be recorded. In fact, we did when we, both my husband and I had these experiences. And when we had them, we recorded them so that we would not forget anything. It was just so amazing. I mean, what we're involved in, we just felt it was so amazing that we had to record it. And then when he passed too, I knew that I just had to take those recordings and make a book because again and again, we knew there is no death, you know, and that helps us to survive. And I think it's also our heritage to be in touch with those we love on the other side. Then we can heal. But this has been severed in Western culture, and we've done everything in Western culture to sever it in every other culture. And we need to reconnect that because that that we uh, we must have for our own survival is contact with the other side, co-create with that side. And uh, I had uh, had loved Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, uh, and Jung said, and I have discovered for myself as a teacher of myth and fairy tale and dreams, that there are organizing principles that produce these dreams and visions. 
uh, and fairy tales that they're not these stories that we experience are not random stories or created by the left brain by the conceptual brain there is an organizing principle within the human psyche that constructs these stories and so Jung real I mean he worked with thousands and thousands of patients and he saw that there was an, or, an organizing principle in their dreams specifically related to that person's development. Sometimes it's a complementary dream, or sometimes it's telling us something of the future, but they're always guides uh, to our development, just as the fairy tales are and the myths and, and visions. If there's something really negative about the human being that we uh, receive as a story, this is not out of the human psyche. The psyche is totally in support of our development. <laughs> and, uh, and I say this because many of the myths that were organized by these inner principles were inverted by those in power who wanted us to believe we were nothing. So uh, these dreams will, will be organized by these principles for our growth and development. But I think that many people, because of our culture, we've been told that's nonsense. There's nothing to it. You ate too much, you know, that kind of thing. But if we pay attention, Kim and I uh, have a radio show through Bob Ginsburg's Forever Family with Janet Mayer, and she is uh, a medium, but she's, uh, she's just very perceptive. And she's always saying, pay attention, you know, give attention to these things, because sometimes I'll wake up and I will have had a dream and I feel like it's nothing, you know, it's first. And then I think, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and I, I would make myself write them down. Sometimes we have what just seems like nonsense. It's like a lot of different fragments and we don't know what's going on. And if we pay attention even to that, but if it doesn't make sense, just wait. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. But maybe the psyche is just, you know, sort of doodling <laughs> and thinking. <laughs> but I think that when you when we receive those dreams, that are the big dreams we know, oh, pay attention to this. This is a real guide for our development. So I think another biggest myth is, again, going to the picture, like sitting down and holding this. So a lot of people think meditation is sitting, counting your breath, which is what I thought when I started meditation. And so I was like, oh, you have to focus on counting your breath. And it's so difficult, cannot concentrate. Again, that's why I thought I'm just going to fail. It's not going to work. Um, but like that's because we talk about different style of meditation, but there are also movement meditation. Um, so there's meditations that you can, you know, dance, you move your body. In fact, yoga itself can be a part of meditation because you're moving your body. And afterwards, you have that moment of silence for yourself. Some people describe to me, you know, their run when they go out for a run in a park or a go to swim in the ocean. For them, it's meditation. And that's totally true. It doesn't have to be just sitting inside a room. So there's walking meditation or even just going walks in nature. Um, if they bring a dog or the children, sometimes it's very meditative or sometimes for people cooking is very meditative. Um, or sometimes they do something creative with their own hands, like painting, drawing, even writing can be very meditative. So meditation can actually take in a lot of forms. It doesn't have to be just sit and count your breath which is also very difficult for me, too. Um, when I was young, uh, it would feel as though information was coming into the back of my head at the base of my skull. Uh, it would be as though something was feeding electrical energy and I could feel it. It would just come in and it would like make the whole back of my head tingle. And I'd feel that and I'd be like, okay, something's going to happen. Uh, something's, something is coming through. And I learned uh, how to channel that and use cards, palm, other ways to kind of take what was coming in and I was receiving at the base of my skull. I know it sounds a little weird, but uh, that was how it happened for me. And so I just... One of the greatest gifts that I was given as a child is I was told not to critique the information as it's coming through. I was told to let it flow. There's something called stream of consciousness in writing, and there are examples of that, you know, James Joyce, other writers who would just let the information flow through them, right? 
And so that's really what my ancestors taught me. Get it, let it flow through you, let it come through you. You can critique it afterwards, but don't critique it while you're doing it. And I think that was one of the best pieces of information, the greatest gift that they gave me. Because it sounds crazy when this information comes out. You know, I've said some crazy things to people that have sounded off the wall that ended up happening. If I had stopped myself when it was coming through me and not said it, then I would not have been able to provide them with important information that they needed. Um, there was an example of that. There was a woman who came to see me years ago. She was from a little small town in Texas, and I told her that I kept seeing her in Paris, France insane i said this is going to sound so crazy and she thought i was literally out of my mind five years later the woman showed up she in fact ended up in paris she had become a hairstylist and she ended up meeting somebody who took her there and if i had really stopped and not told her that because i thought i was sounding crazy then she wouldn't have gotten the reading that she deserved right well, genealogy started for me, I've been doing it for over 15 years, uh, and, but it was, as you said, the spiritual connection started to come in because I understood as I was researching and finding the incredible stories, truly a spiritual, you know, our ancestors are around us and, you know, they really came in right away. But I will say that the greatest leap that I made was my husband passed away six years ago. Um, he unfortunately passed away from alcoholism. So it was a, it was a difficult, um, it was a difficult illness for him to have. And we had a deep spiritual connection, but it was as he was going through that. Uh, um, and I was still doing the ancestry and working with people. My ancestors came in to support me along this path. And that is where the that is where the opening came. And it made me understand that the work I was doing with um, helping people build their family trees and discover those ancestral stories and the roots that they had, that I was taking them on um, an ancestral healing journey because our ancestors have have gone through many of the same things that we are going through. And we know now that science tells us that the experiences they had and the, um, the traumas that they went through have been passed down to us. So that is, is where the bigger opening came. Uh, but I also am trained in grief and trauma. So I have I worked in a, um, a middle school, a primary school with students who were on an alternative team who had experienced trauma. And I was um, somebody who worked with their behaviors, but as part of a mental health team. So I knew what trauma responses looked like and I knew what trauma, um, how it comes through our bodies and what it looks like. And so those two kind of met up with my genealogy. And it really was where I was able to start to understand um, the calling and the gift of what I was able to share with people. So that's kind of where it all began or where it all kind of came together. I think it varies a lot. I have seen different things based on a person's senses that are most prominent and how they process the world energetically. Because I think we're all a little different in that way. Like one, a person might be a feeler and they say, I feel this intense feeling around me or like this, this is off or this person doesn't feel good or whatever, right? They'll say that a lot. Another person might not be in that feeling energy as much. They might be more logical or in a sense of knowing. And so theirs comes through a little differently and then they don't know how to process the feelings and that might be a stuck energy too if they are not able to tap into it so it's really different i've seen a lot of different responses based on people's senses that goes into all the things like the clairvoyance and the clairsentience and things like that so we're all intuitive we're like these antennas right we can pick up on things with other people around us in the physical world and our angels and guides and we might have different ways of using that antenna 
So, you know, I'm a feeler, so I might feel more. I also have a lot of clairvoyance, so I might see more and I might talk about colors, but to someone else, maybe they don't have that interpretation. They may do a meditation and never see images like I see or see colors. They might just feel different things or just feel relaxed. You know, there's different responses based on that person's um, abilities within their intuition and also what they're open to at that time and maybe where they are in their journey. So it, it does vary. And I think based on that, I would try to work on what are your strengths and how you can connect and, and don't try to be something you're not, you know, like if you're not really, it's like, if I wouldn't be like an auto mechanic or something, like I'm not good at it. I wouldn't be somebody taking care of plants. Cause I think I tend to not take care of plants very well. Right. So I'm not going to be a gardener. Um, I think that we can learn how to do the ones that we maybe are not as strong in, but we should definitely use our strengths more first, because what that does is it gives us that confidence and the ability to trust in the messages so we can build on the other ones later. Well, I mean, I, I had my mother was very religious. And so she would talk about miracles as if they were everyday events which proved to be correct, you know, um, but, uh, but then it kind of went away, you know, and uh, I was 19 and I was go. I had two issues. I was going through this existential angst that I'm sure every 19 year old goes through, but there were two issues that were, in, I thought were unsolvable. And and I was just, I mean, it had overtaken my life, my life, you know, my studies. I just, <clears throat> I was trying to figure out how to solve these two issues. And, and within a very short period of time, this man appeared in my life and a dream. And the dream was absolute, I mean, I can visualize it as if it was happening right now. And, um, and so what, um, basically, I mean, I'm just going to basically what the dream was, I was, um, <clears throat> I was wearing a bride's dress, a bridal dress on a stage with no, with no groom. Okay. And, and I, I couldn't believe all these people who were there to see me. And, and then fast forward to the end of the dream, I looked down I, and, and these people are, are filing past me. And so I thought it was like the reception line, you know, and I look down, I'm still wearing the wedding dress, but I'm in a coffin and it freaked me out. And in the middle of the night, I went to this man's house who I trusted with everything. And what he told me uh, was, life-changing and what he said to me because I thought you know this portended my death you know like I was going to get hit by a truck or something and what he said no he said this has nothing to do with physical death he said there's a part of you that you don't need anymore and that is what has died making room for the new and everything fell into place and I literally was transformed. I, I I was transformed into another person. I entered womanhood. I and and that was not lost on me. So I thought, okay, how can this happen? So then I started to pay attention. And so more things happened. And then I learned how to say thank you. And the more I said thank you, the more things happened. And, and my friends would say, oh, you know, these things only happen to you, which was a little annoying because I'm not special. I'm not a saint or a guru. And uh, then, oh, and 16 years ago, um, it, again, co coincidence, coincidence, coincidentally, I was facing a medium and she told me that I was going to write a book. And I argued with her. I said, oh, I said, I'm sorry, but that's not in the cards. Um, 
you know, I have nothing to write about. And uh, also I'm a people person. There's no way I'm gonna sequester myself and write a book. And uh, in 2011, I was reconnecting with a childhood friend, told her my latest miracle. She says, oh, Sophia, these things only happen to you. And something clicked. And I went, you know, everyone has a coincidence story, a miracle story, but you know, these have guided my life. I mean, they're so numerous that, and then what, what I, when I discovered the key that, so what I believe is that this divine intelligence, there's this divine intelligence, God, whatever you want to call this thing that you can have a personal relationship with, this divine intelligence knows better what's good for us than we do and communicates with us in very, very clever ways. And um, so through dreams, uh, meeting a person and having that person tell you exactly what you need to know to solve your problem. And in my case, puts coincidences in my path to nudge me. So the key to taking a coincidence and turning it into a miracle is taking action on it. If I just said, oh, wow, this is so, wow, such a coincidence, and then just let it go. But that was the key. And once I discovered the key, I wanted to share it. So I think that self-love event is like this slow moving takeaway, takeaway. And I was talking to a client the other day and she growing up, her, her family members would tell her, you know, you're no good, this, that, but she always innately knew. She's like, that's not the truth. I know I'm good. But even though she knows that and she still knows that today, she's running into some barriers in her life. And we unpack that actually a part of her took on that belief, that belief that she's, you know, not good and difficult and all these different narratives. But the other narrative might be louder, but it doesn't matter because it's a monster in the back room. So and then I think what happened is like, as we get older, we take this major detour down the road of personal development of like, that is self-love that, and, and to me, that is lowercase self-love. That is what uh, lowercase love, that is separation. That is, I'm an individual. That is my needs need met before I can help you. That is very, this focus of, um, oneness or not oneness of separateness uh, of duality of us not being in it, one being connected and then we go down that until we realize like oh crap that's not what i'm seeking either right like that's why there's millions of personal development books out there and millions of new personal development gurus coming forward because it's never enough because it's not actually what you're seeking what you are actually seeking is capital self capital self love, which is this deep knowingness that we are one and you are seeking to heal for the purpose of healing, not to make your external life any better. And it's for the, and it doesn't even have to that you think it's for the oneness in the moment, but when you are not doing it for yourself in the matter of, you know, if, if I practice self-love, I'll be better at my job. If I practice self-love, I'll be a better wife. If I practice it, because that's looking at you as an individual, but instead looking at you as like, I want to love myself at the deepest layers, just because no matter if anything outside of me changes, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I know that really it's my internal state of being that impacts all of this. That's tapping into the oneness. That's tapping into the massive mind that is here in the understanding that 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 we're one. So I don't know if I completely answered your question, but I think it's been like a whole trajectory of things and then massive confusion, right? Because the the ego and fear, how do you keep people in a place of control and, and, and stuck? You keep them in a place of fear. So again, like words, why would it be so easy? Yeah. It's not. Like it, it, if it was so easy, like that's a whole different conversation for a different day, but things would look so much differently. Like everybody that is in the music industry game, whether you're a songwriter, artist, like most of us will tell you that it's something that we need to do or we've always 
felt born to do it or called to do it. And I think that that, I can't say whether or not, you know, genetically that that's a, um, a thing, but I, I do know that most of us that are in this industry are super passionate about it. And like, we are obsessed with it. And, and for that reason alone, I think that when you know something is your calling, it, it just is. Um, but creativity is interesting because I mean, I came into this field as a you know singer songwriter, and I knew that that was an aspect of my life that was always going to be in my life. I did not know that I would end up actually writing books or you know starting a podcast or you know there's I think creativity can kind of take all types of twists and turns if you let it. Um, and so much of it is around your curiosity. Um, how curious can you get about? yourself and the ways that you can become creative. So I think that's really exciting is that whether you're a creative or not, you can always find ways to incorporate different ways of creativity in your life. I never tell people it was easy. I've put so much time and energy and resources into developing as the best medium I can possibly be. I'm very focus. Then with mediumship, it's like, okay, let's sell my massage practice. Let's not have time for painting and just put all my passion into developing as the most accurate medium I can possibly be. And then the teaching part was kind of natural because I naturally teach everything I know. I've, and now my passion is teaching mediumship. Of course, there's been a big revolution of kindness out there with the hippie movement, Haight Ashbury and the whole hippie scene. There was that had happened. This was in the summer of '67. It was called the Summer of Love, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually I'm actually associated with a person in Denver who had been there in that Summer of Love. So I knew there was something very spiritual and and then very special that had happened during that Summer of Love. Now it was just it was about um, 14 months later in the December of '68, and I was thinking maybe there's something still going on there, even the Summer of Love is passed. There must be some remnants of the summer of love still happening. So that's why I was drawn to San Francisco, hate Ashbury. The catch-up was left of this famous summer of love. My friend in Denver had turned me under the Hare Krishna mantra. Oh. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I knew it was a powerful way, a powerful meditation. And I already knew about it. And when I got to hate Ashbury, after hitchhiking all the way from Houston, but not even a penny to my name, even throwing my IDs away and throwing my draft card away, which is illegal to cut my relationship with, with the material world. But I got out there, and the first people I met were the Hare Krishna devotees coming out of Golden Gate Park, invited me to their temple. So I was originally, I was actually meant to do that because I connected with the Hare Krishna people then. I wasn't ready to join but because I thought they were cool, but a little bit too, too uh, esoteric for me. <laughs> In India, you see, there's... In Indian society, there's different levels. You know, you can be a worker, you can be a businessman, you can be a politician. But the highest level, the highest rung of the social ladder in Indian culture is to be a holy beggar, a mendicant, they call it. That's considered the top, the top level of, of the Vedic society, beyond the beyond the uh, workers, the businessmen, and the politicians and warriors. To be a, a, a mendicant or a, a holy beggar who's given up everything to to absorb himself in meditation and teaching others that science. That's the highest level of society in Vedic culture. I'm stuck here. I can't. Uh, and then somebody called me from New Zealand and said, I'd like you to be on my podcast. And I had no idea what that was. And I says, I can't afford to fly to New Zealand. No, no, you do it on Zoom. So, of course, her lights went out. Uh, I mean, we had nothing but trouble uh, trying to get that thing uh, to work, but she also had had an NDE, so we got double trouble here. In fact, the entire block, she said, went out. She says, I've lived here 15 years. This has never happened. We, you know, She had to call me back and say, I don't know what happened. The whole block's down. <laughs> it's really hilarious. So uh, that started one, and then somebody said, I saw you on her show, and now I've done a, over 140 of these things. Uh, because that's what God wants me to do. You know, I was sent back to give this message, which most people are surprised to hear. Um, there's a couple statistics I like. Um, 
of, of all the NDEs I've heard now, the distressing ones, and I've heard quite a few now because they find me and um, want to tell it. Usually on my um, sharing group, we have uh, second Thursday of the month through IONS. It's for the dr- distressing people. And I can't tell you how many times they say, I have never told my story to anybody, but I feel safe here. So, but this, this is one of the things. And I would say 85% of the people or more that have distressing experiences are Catholics. And I think that's fun. I mean, it's a good statistic. We are taught from a very early age that there's purgatory and it's just like hell, except you get out and it doesn't matter that Jesus saved you or anything else. You're going to have to do your time. And I believe we make our own purgatory because we expect it. And I, I believe also that if someone this Catholic is going to die, they're going to get over there and say, oh man, there's no purgatory. It's just us that come back to tell people, don't worry about it. You know, it's not going to happen unless you want to. There are some souls that they don't want to be happy. They don't want to be with God. I mean, there's positive energy on this planet and negative energy and energy cannot be destroyed or created it just changes so if if there there's probably and i don't like to think about it too much because it you know can get stuck on you there's probably a place for negative energy on the other side and those souls that want to go they can go but that's not god doing that uh for example especially if if you say you go to see a psychiatrist they prescribe an antidepressant and it makes you feel worse um it, it's very hard to think, okay, well, this makes me feel worse, but I'm supposed to take it for the rest of my life. Now, there's there's a couple of factors to that to consider first, and and that's uh, the, the factor that uh, psychiatric medication takes a while for you to adjust to, and it takes a while to work properly, so you have to give it time. Um, but sometimes, even, even after that time and that adjustment process, um, it's still not the right medication for you. Um, so someone who was uh, someone who was reluctant to take medications, um, I guess what I would say to them would be just you know uh, take takes take the time it's it's going to take to to find out if that medication will work for you. And once you've given it six weeks, two months, um, you know. Um, once you've given it the proper amount of time, don't be afraid to go back to your psychiatrist and say, this is not working. I need something else. You know, there's so many medications out there and they react differently to people. And and this is something also, um, I, I, I used to work in a psychiatric hospital as a creative writing teacher. And one of the first things I would teach people about would be keeping a journal. And keeping a journal is something excellent, especially if you're starting off uh, with uh, medications. Because then you can write down and, and track your progress as to like what my mom first started keeping a journal before I did. Uh, she she had psychiatric problems as well. Uh, and what she would do is she would write the date and then she'd write a number from one to ten of her mood. And then she would basically just just write. And um, it's a helpful tool in, in realizing, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um what I should be doing, what I should not be doing, that sort of thing. Especially if you go back, you know, after some time and and look at what you've written. Yes. Well, I started to, I was a tomboy when I was younger because I had my older brother. And if I wanted to keep up with him and play in the neighborhood with the kids, then I had to keep up. So he really helped foster that um, athletic side of me. And my dad would always play tennis and he would take us to the park and he would, you know, hit balls with us. But then after my my eldest was born, my neighbor said, hey, let's let's run to the corner of 7-Eleven. And this was, I was 22 when I had my first child. And I said, well, I'm not a runner. And when we got back from that short run, I thought, this is it. I love this. And I just never stopped. When my son was in the hospital, um, I didn't stop either. I brought my jump rope with me and I would take breaks out on the patio and where other parents were out there smoking cigarettes and, you know, just getting a breath of fresh air or whatever it was away from that situation of the hospital. I would be out there jumping rope and talking to the parents. And that really 
helped me. It's helped me through a lot of things. I mean, as far as, you know, my mother's addiction, I mean, it's obvious that I'm probably addicted to adventure and, um, you know, physical activity, but I think that's better than she was addicted to drugs and alcohol. Because I was so used to, like you said, shoving it aside and putting it in a place where I didn't have to feel because, and I think I was able to do that, which is not a healthy <laughs> coping mechanism, but that's all I knew. Um, I was used to it because when my you know, mom would come home drunk and we would hide underneath the beds because we were so scared, my brother and sister and I, because of the screaming and her fighting, and it was just awful. So we learned at a young age how how to take care of ourselves. And that's the way that we did it. And so I just did the same thing when my son passed away until I went to therapy. And it's still, the communication is so key. And this is, as you know, to anything, but if we don't talk about it, and I tell my clients that it's okay if you're not ready to work on it, but it's going to come out later in life. When you're not expecting it, something will trigger it. Yes, for sure. That is like kind of the impetus of most of my work is that people have a conversation. So so part of my intent around my work is just as a woman artist practicing and sharing my perspective because more, we need more women to share their perspective creatively because we're, you know, half of the population or a lot of the population as well as uh, underrepresented artists non-binary artists we need more more of us telling our stories so that's like a very basic part of it but then in addition to that I do a lot of like I said body prints so I'm looking at body image and the gaze and I want people to think about that when they're looking at um the old masters or even magazines or social media like how the body is represented and I really want to challenge traditional representations of the body that's why I abstract it with my body prints and then a lot of my work is in tribute to other women or feminist artists around me or from art history because uh, women artists, especially uh, women artists of color, have been left out of textbooks and museums and uh, galleries. Um, and we, we are still very underrepresented and often misrepresented. And so um, a lot of my work is in tribute to an individual uh, woman artist. So I, I want people to to learn about them as they go and as they look at my work and talk about them and ask them. I love when people ask me questions about them. And so, yeah, I kind of have multi missions and some of my work is about motherhood as a mother artist. There's, that's a whole nother uh, discussion challenge and, and everything. So I, uh, yeah, multiple intense with a lot of my series and some of it is just playful, but a lot of it is pretty intentional um, geared towards um, people learning and acknowledging and recognizing and respecting women artists and women's perspectives. It's just, it's a, some people incarnate in this lifetime with the bully, the abuser, or the victimizer archetype. Those are archetypes. Um, and that's what they're, I used to call them the dogs of karma. Um, because I noticed, I mean, I worked with some people and I was like, you really, like, you don't do anything with your life except hurt other people. You literally don't do anything else. That's all you do. Straight up. I think that they are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, it may be people's karma. They're meeting out karma to some people. Um, or they are just, you know working in the interest of some darker forces that are at play in our world. You know, the, the function, a part of the function of abuse is to raise awareness. And sometimes there are sacrificial lambs. Uh, like, for example, I'm dating myself here, but um, if you remember the O.J. Simpson case from three decades ago, um, I believe he totally did it. Uh, but I remember, I'm old enough to remember after that case, um, there was uh, an increase in information and awareness about domestic violence. Okay, so I don't support or condone the loss of two innocent lives, uh, but it, it, it did um, ultimately uh, play a purpose, at, at the very least, in raising awareness for the rest of us. Um, 
sometimes, you know, that's the function of evil in this world. 